When I was a teenager, my country, Iran, was at war for eight years. Later, I worked as a journalist covering the war in Afghanistan. Disaster is something that has been around most of my life. Perhaps it was preparing me for March 11, 2011, Japan. When the building started shaking in Tokyo at 2.46 in the afternoon, most people's immediate concern was themselves. Then the word came that the situation farther to the northeast was much worse. A European TV network called, wanting me to get its crew into the crisis area. We made our way to Sendai, past blocked roads and broken bridges. I thought we were going to cover the disaster. Little did I know that the disaster had only begun. Yes, we made our way to Sendai, and the more devastations we saw, the less we were able to hold down to our journalistic sense of detachment. When the news of nuclear meltdowns came, the reporter's company ordered them to get out and return to Europe. We headed for the airport in Aomori, up north, where they could get a flight to Seoul. But along the way, our progress was interrupted by a seven-plus aftershock and tsunami warning. We had to enter the highway. The gate was closed. Nobody there, totally abandoned. I had to open it, and I did it. I'm sorry, not in a good, polite way, but I opened the door, the gate of the highway, and we entered the highway. We drove along a totally empty highway for over 300 kilometers to get the reporters to the airport. They made their flight. I spent two weeks in the disaster area before returning to the relative safety of Tokyo. Something, however, was calling me back to Tohoku, and I call it love. Up until now, I had covered earthquakes, floods, avalanches, refugee crises, wars, generally many disasters. As a reporter, this was an avoidable task for me. But unfortunately, I had never let my humanitarian feeling surface for fear of being distracted from the story. And that was a big miss. This time, however, I realized that such a feelings were the story for me and for countless others. A natural disaster could happen to any of us, anytime, anytime, absolutely, no exception. So I organized what I call the tour of love. Simple, the tour of love. I invited friends in Japan to join me and together to visit the disaster to have a share of that love. The response was amazing. You can see. My room started filling up with Persian rugs, toys, stationeries, chocolates, and all sorts of beautiful things. The contributions came from people of many nationalities, all motivated by human emotion that binds us together. And I call it love. My original plan of going once inevitably changed. I was honored to be a porter and driver for 10 trips to Tohoku and the Fukushima area joined by many friends. And I since have him back more than 60 times, and I'm sure I will go again, despite the risks. 
Shortly after the tour of love, in mid-April 2011, an Iranian businessman who wanted to offer a contribution called me and asked for the most urgent need in the disaster area. Actually, I had heard about a village called Ita Temura in Fukushima, which was suffering from high levels of radiation. And the residents were in desperate need for mineral water. The radiation, radioactive contamination was extremely high there, and the people had no drinking water, and no one take for them. And, I mean, not a good situation. The businessman wasted no time in importing mineral water from abroad. And I ended up with five tons of bottled water to take to Itotemura. Five tons in that time. <laughs> Actually, I used to be a reporter, usually at the time of the disaster. This time, I turned to a porter. Honor. <laughs> there is not a big difference between a reporter and a porter for me. All this time, I thought I was going to the disaster area to help. Yes. But it turned out that I was being helped. True. I was being helped. I was diagnosed with, with Parkinson's disease. As the symptoms of my Parkinson's disease worsened and my health going down, I discovered that turning my attention to the needs of others gave me the energy I needed for them and for myself. The power of love is not a new story. I repeat, the power of love is not a new story. It started with the day of creation, and it has been going on all the way, and I believe there is no end for that. My energy is not what it was. One of the heroes of Persian culture and literature had figured it out 1,000 years ago. I am speaking of the poet Molana Rumi. He wrote, in, I mean, I say first in original Farsi, Rahi par az balas, vali esh bishvast. Life is a path filled with obstacles and troubles. But should love be the guide, it will teach us how to move forward. In the treasury of my mother tongue, Persian or Farsi, the word love or ish is a way of life. Tender, beautiful, delicate. It is an eternal source of energy that nourishes the mind, the heart, and the body. Love motivates and inspires and leads to peace and happiness and prosperity. I, today, I coexist with my Parkinson's disease. And I have no problem with that. I mean, in body I have problem, but it's fine. I've seen it the love there in Iran and here in Japan. With a very small camera, I made a short movie, which in my opinion, defining love without any language, no music, no dialogue, no nothing. Please watch.
Thank you. And I now realize that love must be your guide. And love, as perfectly Rumi says, will teach us the way for this Iran in Japan and for all of us. Again, Rumi says in Farsi that در نگنجد عشق در گفت و شنید عشق در یا است غیرش نپرید Thank you very much.